Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Marcel Fabian, and I'm a postdoc with Professor Roy Bear at the Hebrew University. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you my good friend and colleague, Ben Spiro. Uh, ben did his bachelor degree in chemistry in Jerusalem, and then his uh, master under the supervision of Professor Roy Bear, uh, where he's currently doing his PhD. The topic of Ben's talk is forces from stochastic density functional theory in a local basis set representation. And it's part of a multi-group collaboration on uh, stochastic methods and electronic structure theory uh, between the groups of Eran Rabani in Berkeley, Daniel Neuhauser at UCLA, and Professor Roy Bear at Hebrew University. So thank you, Marcel, for uh, um, uh, this kind of introduction. And yes, today, I would like to tell you about my work um, developing and uh, implementing the ability to calculate forces in our stochastic DFT code. Um, like Marcel uh, said, there's a few versions of stochastic DFT. The one that uh, I'm working on is uh, one that is uh, in a Gaussian basis of representation that has been developed by myself and Marcel under the supervision of Wei uh, Bear at the uh, Hebrew University. So um, let's just dive into what it is that we're interested in. We want to be able to, we want to develop uh, uh, ab initio methods that will allow us to study biological disordered systems. Um, and the first, uh, the first challenge that come with this, with such systems is just from their size. So if we want to correctly describe a biological molecule, we also have to take its, um, its surrounding into account. And then even a, a small peptide of just about uh, over 200 uh, atoms as this tryptophan two zipper, if we want to describe it correctly, we solve it with about 425 water molecules, and now the system is 1,500 um, atoms and over 4,000 electrons. And now it's typically the size of system that would, would usually be treated with some empirical methods. And that's what we, what we want to avoid. We want to solve and treat such systems with uh, stochastic DFT. And the first, first uh, step for studying such systems is to uh, find their structure and for that, we need the forces. And so this is kind of an introduction to, um, to my talk. But before we get to the forces, let's start a bit more general with stochastic DFT. And the idea is, is, uh, of stochastic DFT is to calculate um, expectation value as traces based on the stochastic trace formula that says that the trace of, an, of a matrix A is the expected value of expectation values calculated using random vectors chi. And the requirement of these random vectors chi is that if we take the expected value of their outer product with itself, we'll get the identity matrix. So just to briefly explain how we do that, we generate a random vector chi with plus and minus ones, and then build a matrix uh, using its outer product with itself. And these matrices will always be um, with ones on the diagonal where all the other elements can be plus or minus ones. And the expected value of such matrices will be the identity matrix. And I have a little illustration that we can do, we can have a look. So I have this 20 by 20 matrix here. And every time you see the picture jumps, it's because another chi chi uh, matrix is added to the, uh, to the averaging. And you can see that the diagonals are always one where all the other off diagonal elements are going to uh, zero. And we can also say something about the convergence. It goes down like one over the square root of the number of um, random vectors chi that we sample. So now that we have a stochastic representation of the identity, we can insert that into the trace expression. And then with just um, some rearrangement, we come to the result of the stochastic trace formula. Now we can only take final samples so we approximate the stochastic trace formula using I stochastic vectors. So we have in the end an average over I random expectation values. Okay. Um, like I said, we're also using a Gaussian um, atom centered basis. So phi alpha will be Gaussians that are centered around a nuclear uh, coordinates R. And since they are non orthogonal, we will have an overlap matrix, and we can also write any operator in matrix form by uh, taking this, uh, what I call sandwich with a, with a basis function. Uh, what I do wanna say about these uh, is that since we're, gonna, we're aiming to look at large systems, we expect the, these matrices to be very sparse. We only have to consider alpha and beta neighbors or 
not direct neighbors, but that, that, that they're in the vicinity of each other. And actually this little picture here of a sparse matrix is actually a, a, a big underestimation because for the system that I've described before, more than 90% of the elements, uh, if we consider the full matrix will actually be zero. Um, as a result, we use uh, uh, sparse uh, matrix structures that will allow us to, um, to store and apply these matrices on vectors in a more efficient way. But um, the sparsity of these matrices does not necessarily extend to the density matrix, which is, of course is key when we want to calculate expectation values of observables. So what we actually need is the trace of the matrix multiplication of O general uh, matrix O and uh, the density matrix. So to highlight what we do in, in stochastic DFT, let's do a very quick brief uh, uh, a review of constant density, density functional theory, where at every step of the SCF, we have to solve the generalized uh, eigenvalue problem of the root and whole equations. This will give us the coefficient matrices C and the eigenenergies uh, E, from which we can build the density matrix written here using the Fermi-Dirac occupation uh, function as we work in a finite temperature formalism. And then once we have P, we can calculate the density and then get a new Hamiltonian and so on and so on um, until we get a self-consistent uh, solution. Now the bottleneck of quantum DFT comes from this general, generalized eigenvalue problem which scales uh, cubically with system size. Um, essentially what it does is finding the quantum orbitals, which is exactly what we're going to avoid when we do stochastic DFT. What we're gonna have instead is a matrix free approach to the density matrix. So we don't, oh, we don't actually calculate the density matrix. Uh, we don't store it in memory, but we do know how to apply it onto a vector, um, which is done here using, again, the Fermi-Dirac function, but uh, the matrix, the, um, of overlap inverse uh, matrix and the Hamiltonian uh, matrix. There's quite, quite a bit of technical detail involved in how we apply uh, P on a vector chi. Um, however, I don't have time to go into that to, uh, today, uh, but the detail can be seen in this uh, paper that we have from a couple of years ago. Um, okay, so continuing, we still have to do, a, to, to do an SCF cycle and at every step of the SCF, we solve for the uh, density stochastically. Uh, what I've written here is a general expression for how we're going to calculate um, any observables. Um, okay. One nice thing about our uh, code is that it's perfect for par parallel, I can't say that word, I'll try one more time, parallelization. Okay. Um, because if we want to do the average over I, um, stochastic orbitals, well, if we're lucky enough and we have at our disposal, disposal um, I CPUs, we can just ask each one of these CPUs to perform just one of these expectation values. And as the bottleneck of this calculation is when P is applied on chi, asking each CPU to perform that only once will highly, uh, will, high, yeah, will improve the efficiency of our code. Okay, so now let's look a little bit about some uh, SDFT uh, calculations because uh, the key is if we're going to approximate the stochastic trace formula, we're going to have some fluctuations. So we we're going to have statistical errors. So we want, we want uh, to have a closer look at those. So in, in, these, uh, uh, in this example, we're looking at the energy per electron as a function of uh, the number of stochastic, stochastic orbitals used uh, in the calculation where, um, where the system is a cluster of 237 water molecules. And for, for the beginning, let's just focus on the, blue, on, on the blue points. So to get each one of these points, we chose a number of stochastic orbitals, for example, 100, repeated the calculation some 10 or 15 times, cal calculated the average, that would be uh, the, the blue circle. And also, since we have 10 or 15 runs, we could ask what's the standard deviation, which we use here as an error bar. And the first thing that we notice is that as we increase the number of stochastic orbitals, we get closer and closer to the deterministic result marked here with this star. But what we can also see is that if we just focus on, on one of, uh, uh, on a given number of stochastic orbitals, is that the error bars seem to indicate that we're converging to a value around here, which is some 5% off of the, of the, uh, of the uh, value that we would want to have. And this points to the fact that we have a bias, an inherent bias in our uh, stochastic DFT calculation. So to have a 
kind of different look at the, uh, at the errors. We also plotted the same data um, differently. So this time we're looking at, the, again, the energy per electron, but as a function of i, not function of one over i. And we plot the actual standard deviations here in triangles and the errors here in the squares. And what we see, first of all, is, this, is that the uh, standard deviations, this, this is a sanity check we, we always do, that it sits very nicely on a slope of one over the square root of i. So it's in agreement with the central limit theorem. Um, but the second thing that we see is that when, when the standard deviations are smaller than the errors, um, the interpretation we give to that is that the, that the, uh, the bias is the dominating fact in the, in the errors. And then we see uh, that the errors went down like one over i. So the question is, we, how do we avoid that? Because if we have a bias, we're going to converge to the wrong results, which will be very bad. So one way to dramatically uh, improve on SDFT is to use a, an idea of embedded fragments. So in this little picture here, imagine that this is our system. And then I break it up into chunks or fragments that are small enough so that I can calculate them uh, deterministically without affecting the scaling of the overall uh, calculation. And then what I do is, for each fragment, I'll, uh, I'll make a calculation uh, deterministically and stochastically and look at their difference and use that difference as a correction to the overall stochastic calculation. And when we do that, this is now the orange points. When we do that, we have a dramatic uh, uh, improvement. And if we look at the, at the bottom panel here, one way to understand the results is that now the errors are dominated by the fluctuation rather than the bias. And this is the, the regime where we want to work. Okay, so finally we reached uh, uh, the forces. Uh, and what we want to do is to derive trace-based uh, expressions for the forces so that we could use a stochastic trace formula to calculate them. And we approach it in the following way. Imagine that we displace a nucleus C by some delta Cx along the x-axis. The question is, what is the work done by the electronic forces on the nucleus, on, the, on this nucleus? So the answer is that it, since we're working in finite temperature uh, formalism, it's the change in, uh, in uh, electronic free energy. So um, if we look at the variation in the electronic free energy, it can give us an expression uh, for, the, uh, for the forces. So what we have to do is look at the variation in each one of the terms, uh, the, electronic, the electronic energy, the number of electrons, and the entropy of the non-interacting electrons, um, and to sum them all up. When, when, uh, uh, when we do that, oh, I think I accidentally skipped a slide, but yes, one second. Um, sorry about that. For some reason, I hit a slide that wasn't supposed to be hidden. Sorry. So as I said, we have to take the look at the variation in each one of these uh, uh, functionals building the electronic free energy. And okay, so that's what we do now. So we're looking at the variation in each one of, 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 of these terms. And I'm not gonna do the full uh, derivation here, but what I do want to highlight is that there's going to be three effects due to this displacement of, uh, of delta C in uh, delta C uh, X. The first one will come from the fact that in the electronic energy, we have um, the external potential marked here, the, the, written here as a matrix. But uh, yeah, but of course, um, the actual um, the actual external potential is dependent uh, uh, on nuclear coordinates. So this is the first type of display of uh, of change that we will have due to the displacement, and this is what we call the explicit force. Um, the second type of, of, uh, of effect is that all of the matrices that we have here, whether it's the kinetic energy, the uh, external potential, the, the overlap matrix, they're all dependent on the basis functions and uh, in the way that we described before in this, uh, we build them using this sandwich. So uh, yeah, so as every uh, basis function uh, that belongs to atom C will be will be will be uh, changed. This will contribute to us what is known as Poole forces. And the third type of effect is that the density matrix itself will also change. But as we choose P such that it minimizes the electronic energy uh, free energy, 
it will not have any contributions to the final uh, result. Okay. So this is the final expression that we arrive at, where we see um, the work expresses a trace of uh, basically two types of, of terms, one of them dependent on delta CH and one of them dependent on delta C uh, S. So what we need to know is how to apply these uh, um, matrices onto a, uh, onto a vector in order to do the stochastic trace uh, calculation. Okay. So we start by looking at, uh, at the matrix elements of delta CH. Here we will have two types of, of uh, contributions. The first one is what I call the direct um, uh, contribution of the fact that the external potential is directly dependent on nuclear coordinates, so that will change. But also we will have the Poulet terms, and they'll be relevant for all terms of the Hamiltonian. And the same will go for the uh, overlap matrix that will always also co contribute uh, these matrix uh, elements that need to be taken into account. Um, and we have to calculate these type of matrices for every single atom in our system. And we're gonna have about 1,500 atoms. So that's gonna be very, uh, very bad if, if, uh, if we're gonna have to store full matrices for, everyone, for every one of these atoms. Uh, but luckily, these matrix, uh, matrices are extremely sparse. So we store them as well in even uh, in different type of uh, uh, sparse uh, structure formats. Um, as the non-zero, uh, the number of non-zero elements is independent of system size, uh, we can uh, count on a linear scaling memory constraint. Um, yeah, so just to give an idea, if we go back to our system that we've described in the beginning, the number of direct terms will be, if we consider a full matrix, it will be 99.9% .9 zeros. And for the pool A, it will be 99.99% zeros. So it's matrices that are essentially completely empty. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, it's, it, like I said, we have an efficient way of, of storing them and applying them uh, on, on vectors that have the dimension of the full system. Okay, so we've discussed forces uh, in the trace formalism. We've discussed uh, stochastic uh, um, observables with their noise. Can noisy forces be of use to us? And here I want to point to the uh, work done by Eitam Arnon, uh, a former member of the group, where he showed that you can implement stochastic DFT forces within a Langevin dynamics framework. The idea in Langevin dynamics is that we add a uh, random force to the, um, uh, uh, sorry, random noise to the forces. And basically stochastic DFT has this random noise already built in. Uh, the only thing that we have to make sure is that the bias is small. Uh, otherwise the, the requirement that the average of the, of the, of the noise is zero will not, be, uh, will not be achieved. Actually, as we do have an inherent bias, this will never be exactly zero, but the question is, can we be close enough to zero such that we get useful results? So this is what we have to keep in mind when we look, when we'll, we'll try and analyze now the statist statistical errors in the forces. Maybe I'll say one more thing that Etam found out is that sometimes the built-in stochastic noise wasn't large enough for what, for what he needed for, uh, in order to do the Langevin dynamics. And he actually had, had to, even in, uh, add an extra random uh, fluctuation to it. So um, we really shouldn't be worried too much about uh, fluctuations, but we are worried about the bias. Yeah, so with that in mind, let's look now at, um, at our calculations. So we go back again to, to, to our uh, tryptophan 2 pep, uh, peptide zipper that we've desc uh, described before. And what we've done after Solvating it in a, in a, in the 425 water molecules, uh, we describe it using uh, three just over 3,000 uh, basis functions, and then we use the embedded fragment approach, and we just look for a simple, uh, the most obvious way to to uh, use the fragments, and and uh, what we did is chose one fragment for the uh, for the peptide for the entire peptide, and the rest of the water molecules we we grouped in about 20 molecules. 20 water molecules per fragment. And then we calculated, calculated the forces on 
the 20 nitrogen atoms uh, in blue here of the, of the peptide so that we will have uh, an example to look at. Okay, so what we did is for each nitrogen atom, we calculate the force, in this case, using 12 stochastic vectors of stochastic orbitals. Uh, and then we repeated the, the calculation um, M amount of times so that we have standard deviation and uh, an average or, and an average error for the results. So this is what we plot here. We have the force on the logarithmic scale on the y-axis and the x-axis is the um, twin, is, is an atom index for the 20 nitrogen atoms uh, with increasing distance from the center of the peptide. The blue circles are the standard deviations and the orange triangles are the, uh, the errors. Now, what we found is that we don't need a very large number of, 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 of repetitions in order to find the standard deviation. And whether we took uh, M to be 50 or M to be 2,800, we, we saw the same standard deviation. And the idea here is the standard deviation of, of one run, okay? If we do one run, what, what, what would we expect um, <clears throat> the fluctuation to be? But as we increase the number of, of repetitions, the, the errors, um, the average errors are highly affected by the number of repetitions. So we went bias hunting. What I mean by that is, let's try and find out, we know the error is composed of a fluctuation uh, and, and a bias. Let's try and narrow it down so that it's composed more or less only by the bias, and then we'll know how large it is, and we'll know if it's gonna pose a problem for us or not. Um, so, with, so for the case of the um, M is equal to 2,800, what we did is, again, it's, it, it's the same plot exactly as we saw before uh, up here. And what we added uh, here below is, is, an, is another uh, plot of, of the same uh, orange uh, triangles, only this time it's on a linear scale. And this time, instead of, of plotting the standard deviation, we used the standard deviation over the square root of, the, of 2,800 in this case to uh, give us an indication of which value uh, uh, or wh where is the area where these um, errors are converging to? And what we can see is that the majority, almost all the atoms are converging to, a, to an error which, uh, um, which is not zero, which means we've highlighted uh, uh, or kind of discovered the bias. And therefore we can give the interpretation of a bias to these, uh, to these errors. Essentially, we reached a regime with 2,800 repetitions that now the, the bias is dominating the errors and no longer the fluctuations. Okay, so the next thing to do is also to look, yeah, uh, the error dominated by the bias, yeah. So the next thing we wanted to do is to look at how the results change when we increase the number of stochastic orbitals that we use. So we have similar types of graph. Again, uh, here for i is equal to 12, i is equal to one, 120, and i is equal to 1,200. And, um, and like always, every time we compare a different number of stochastic orbitals, the first thing we do is we check whether our standard deviation obeys the one over the square root of i um, behavior that we expect according to the central limit theorem. I forgot to say before that the dashed lines are the medians, but let's let's focus on the median here of the i is equal to 12. It's about 5 eV per angstrom. And if we look at the 1,200 case, it's about 0 0.5 eV per angstrom, which means when we increase the number of stochastic orbitals by 100, we had a, a reduction by a factor of 10, which is exactly this behavior that we expect to see. The next thing that we wanted to, to check is for the cases of the 120 stochastic orbitals and 1,200, can we give the interpretation of bias to these, to these errors? So we did the same thing as we did before for the 12, to plot everything on the same y-axis scale, we've zoomed in by a factor of three and a factor of 10 in these two panels. Um, but again, we can see that for the majority, almost all the atoms here, apart from maybe this one and this one, it looks like we're converging to, uh, to a value which is not uh, zero error, which means um, we can give the interpretation of bias to the, um, to the errors that we see in the, uh, to the errors that we found. So to summarize uh, um, for, 
i is equal to 12 is a very small number of stochastic orbitals. So let's not worry about that for now. But to, to summarize, let's look at the 120 and 1,200 cases. We find that the bias over here is about 1.6 uh, electron volt per, uh, sorry, the bias is 0 0.06 electron volt per angstrom, where the standard deviation is about 1.6 electron volt per angstrom. In the 1,200 case, the bias was 0 0.02 EV per angstrom, and the standard deviation was about 0 0.5. Um, oh yeah, I did add the, the 12 as well, but never mind. Uh, what we do see in the end is that uh, the bias is much, much smaller than the standard, standard deviation. And then we can expect that if we just do perform one run uh, and ask, what is the error governed by? It would be governed by the fluctuation and not by the bias. Uh, so I think we were successful in, in, uh, in our bias hunt. We nailed it down. Okay, the next question that came up is how well is the, is the deterministic fragment calculation? So as I said, the entire peptide is also calculated deter deterministically in, as a part of the fragment method. And the question was, well, maybe, maybe that did all the work. Maybe that took us all the way and and the stochastic didn't really do anything on top of that. Um, but as we, we add these gray diamonds here, uh, these are the errors between the calculation from the gas phase peptide, the forces in the gas phase pe peptide, compared to the deterministic result of the entire system. Um, and we can see that for the most part, even in the case of 12 stochastic orbitals, we already have an improvement over the, over the fragment. Maybe it's a bit more clear uh, in the bottom panel when we're not in the log logarithmic scale. Um, so this is something that we, we also saw, of course, continuing in the 120 and 1200. So we have an improvement already in, in i is equal to 12, and then it becomes a significant impro improvement as we increase the number of stochastic orbits. I think one more comment that I want to make about the fragment is that I think we also, we can learn a little bit about where, when and how the fragments are doing a good job. Uh, the fragment errors are much smaller for this, for the first 10 um, uh, nitrogen atoms where uh, they are the ones that are kind of hidden within the, 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 the fragment, uh, as opposed to, the, to, to the, the, the higher atom index that are the, the ones that are further away from the center, for example, this one here. So this kind of highlights that when we choose the fragments, if, if, if there's an area of specific interest, we should put that area in the middle of a fragment rather than on the, on the edges of a fragment. Um, so yeah, this is moving forward. This is something that, that is clear from this, uh, from this analysis. Um, okay. The last thing that we wanted to check was whether the bias depends on system size. Um, and um, so what we did is we took our system and, what we, and we kind of shaved off all the, uh, a lot of the water molecules. So instead of having 425 water molecules to, to, to solvate the system, we only have now 195, but it's a bit difficult to see because this is a two dimensional picture, but it's the same density of uh, water molecules around the, uh, um, um, around the peptide, it's just, uh, um, it, I just took away the ones that are further away. And what we see when we compare the results is that we have a very similar standard deviation and a very similar error. We can see that but from, from the medians. So that means that as we increase our systems, we're not, gonna, we're not going to be forced to increase the number of stochastic orbitals used in order to maintain the same level of error. So that was something that was very important for us to check. Um, okay, so I'm at the end of my talk. So I will summarize. I've uh, described to you stochastic DFT as a highly parallelizable linear scaling DFT code where observables are calculated as stochastic traces um, characterized by statistical errors, a fluctuation, and a bias. Um, this can be reduced efficiently using uh, an embedded fragment method and um, we also derived the trace-based uh, formalism for calculating the forces uh, in the atom-centered basis set representation. The forces exhibit a small bias independent of system size, 
such that we believe that um, when we make runs, errors in the forces will be governed by the fluctuations. And um, this leads us to the future plans, which is to implement uh, stochastic DFT in this formalism uh, as a, a means to perform uh, um, Langevin dynamics and hopefully solve the structure of different peptides uh, in solution. And with that, uh, I'll just say thank you to uh, Roy, my supervisor, uh, uh, to Dr. Marcel Fabian, who introduced me and also uh, was my partner in this research uh, for the first couple of years, and to Roy's collaborators and to uh, my group members, uh, past and present, and to everybody for uh, listening. Thank you.